So let's talk a little bit about a, a hoplite and a phalanx. Um, so first we mentioned we had the thorax, right? The chest plate. Sometimes there's some kind of thigh guard made out of either leather. Um, sometimes it's glued together linen strips. Um, affixing coins or medallions is actually a little bit more Roman. So that might not be fully accurate for this. So let's ignore that. But there were usually some kind of thigh strip and then um, greaves. Now these actually have a leather facing. Um, typically it would just be bronze, but there's, there's metal on the inside and I'm using these because it's one piece of metal that's formed around and there's no straps in the back to hold it up. It simply holds up um, by virtue of it, it being form fitted. Now this cuirass would typically be bronze, not steel, because forming giant sheets of steel was not uh, a technology that was around at this time yet. Yet. Later it will be. Uh, if you think of knights with their shining silvery armor, that's iron or steel, and that's when they can form those steel sheets. But in the ancient Greeks uh, time, they could not, so they used bronze. Now we mentioned that the hoplite's main form of defense was that great big shield called a hoplon. Um, and the hoplon is held up with the armband here called the porpax, and this uh, cord that runs around called the antelab. And when one slides their arm through, like this, you'll notice that the weight is actually suspended mostly from here. Look, see my hand can float around, the shield doesn't wobble. Um, and I grip this antelab to control and move and guide it, but most of the weight is being carried directly by the shoulder here. Uh, and this two strap or support system for the shield was revolutionary. It allowed the shield to be much bigger, much heavier, and much more controllable. So, we have our shield. Um, and as we mentioned actually a little bit earlier, you'll notice that when I use the shield, a bunch of it's sticking out to the side, right? Check out all this. Why? Why would you have that? And the answer, remember, is it's for your buddy, it's not for you. They would protect their right side. So for me, we can imagine another shield right here usually a butt up um, rim against rim, and together we would have a very well protected hoplite phalanx. But my right side is very vulnerable unless I can use my neighbor's shield, and this extra bit, which seems so strange, that's for them. Well, the other guy. Uh, okay, so we also mentioned the helmet. And uh, we talked about how it restricts the, the peripheral vision, breathing, and uh, your ability to hear. But that's okay, because with that hoplite shield, you're essentially completely protected, right? See, even the eyes, I can duck behind, and I'm fine. So, that's pretty awesome. Now, as we said, their main weapon... Their main weapon is the spear, the 8 to 10 foot, this one is 8 foot, uh, we're using safe PVC and pool little for this part, um, you, I, uh, you can do this at home if your parents say it's okay, but this 8 foot spear is the main weapon. And here's the question, the source of much scholarly debate, if the hoplite is going to fight with other hoplites in the phalanx and they're going to press against each other with a uh, shield against the, the back there to help support. Well, I can't really have all of this spear butt sticking out the back there. It's going to make things very hard. So instead, I would have to angle my spear up like this and attack with an overhand thrust. This is the traditional view. Now, there's some problems with this traditional view. Watch the tip of my spear as I thrust. Whoa, it goes way down. It's kind of a problem, right? In order to keep it level, I kind of have to let go some of my fingers there and that would make my grip a lot looser. So some scholars think that this means that the hoplite didn't fight with the spear above their head, that all of this reach is lost, therefore they had to fight like this. You'll notice this thrust is far more natural. But there are a few things we should keep in mind. Uh, one is that I can hold the spear like this. Again, it's free for the person behind me. I can thrust fairly easily and in a fairly controlled manner that way. Um, 
And here's the real clincher. Scholarship right now doesn't seem to acknowledge this. Check this out. I can reverse my grip, right? So when it's looser and we don't need to support each other, I can do this, and then I can do that. My personal theory is that both answers are right. We see it in the art, and the people who were painting these vases clearly knew what was going on. So if we see both, I think we should think that both existed. But there's some things to keep in mind. If I'm doing this, we all need to be doing this. I can't just be out front by myself. Remember, this right side is very vulnerable. So we would have to either switch to the upper grip, um, or I'd have to switch like that. The other thing to keep in mind is that if I'm doing a shield wall and I'm pushing, I'm getting very, very close. I'm shoving in, right? I don't need a lot of reach. I don't want a lot of reach. I don't want to be getting all the way back there because my opponent is locked shield against shield. So that dipping down might not be such a bad thing. And there's a lot of weight in the spear, so that's a lot of armor penetrating power. Maybe we should uh, reevaluate this debate a little bit. I uh, certainly hope that I can add my voice to scholarship at some point. And uh, I think that would be a great paper to write. So potentially in the future, keep an eye out. You might see a paper with my name on it. Um, but in any case, the question about this versus this exists. But scholars do agree that were the spear to break, and as I mentioned, we have to figure that they frequently did break. We hear of them breaking in our sources. That uh, if it fell apart, we would have to have a backup weapon. And for this, typically we have a leaf-shaped blade uh, called the Xiphos. And with this, I would try to reach over and strike at my opponent. Some scholars want to say that you open up and slash, but that seems a little weird to me. The places where a hot blade is most vulnerable is the neck and the inside of the leg there. There's a major artery called your femoral artery, and if you get cut there, that's going to be a problem. So, for that to work, you either have to sort of reach under or reach over, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, frequently we would see uh, this or, or the other type of sword we mentioned, the copus, which really is just used for that overhead strike, um, that slashing motion. But, for the people who want to say that hoplites use the underarm technique, the problem is, well, then what do you use a sword for? If we're standing far apart, this does me no good, right? What am I going to do with this? I can only reach so far. Seems to be, seems to be a bit of a problem. Um, now, the Romans later on, and I'd be happy to do a video talking about the Romans, they used a short sword like this. It was called the gladius. And they did get in close. We know this to be true. Um, and they would, they would punch out. But I think it's anachronistic. That means it's out of the right time to say that the Greeks um, opened up their shields and thrust like that. Um, it just doesn't seem to fit. So, um, some questions about hoplite gear that come up. Well, number one is how flexible is it? I have a pretty good range of motion. Um, one of the big issues that comes up in scholarship is the question of, well, if someone's pushing on you, doesn't that sort of trap your arm and you just basically get stuck? The answer is surprisingly no. Um, with someone pressing here, it keeps most of the, the pressure, remember this is a domed out shape, so it's con, um, convex. It's pressing here. This keeps my arm free. I was actually able to demonstrate this uh, when I presented to an undergraduate class last week. And it was really great to, to show that. But even with someone pressing full force here, I still have full motion. And that makes sense. Why would you use something that prevents you from using your, your spear or your sword? Well, you would. So it's good to show that that, that actually is possible. Um, other things we should talk about. This is really heavy. Try it. Pick it up. You'll have one around. It's hard to hold for a long period of time. And uh, running with it's very difficult. The Greeks had a race called the Hoplitodromia, where they would run in full armor, well, helmet and, and shield. And the Greeks thought this was outrageously funny because people would often crash, they'd lean over, they'd tilt. Um, it was very hard to run with that shield. So I wouldn't want to try it. 
But uh, we have the Battle of Marathon. Apparently the Greeks ran a mile with their shield before going into battle. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email them to me. Um, you'll know how to do that, and I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. A few other things I forgot to mention. One is that when I press my shield up against my buddy's chest plate and we all push together, that pushing motion is called oithismos, or shove. Um, and scholars have debated whether this is a literal shove or a uh, abstract metaphorical shove, like they pushed the enemy back. Well, did they literally push them, or did they not? And um, this debate is also very, very heated. Uh, and there's a couple things we should keep in mind with shoving, right? One is that, A, Greeks fought typically around the summertime. It's really, really hot. I would not want to shove for very long. Number two is that I don't know what kind of traction I would get. Um, remember, this is going to be very churned up, hard to get a footing in type of ground. Uh, it's flat, but after all the people have trampled it, there's stuff on the ground, it's not going to be very good footing. So I'm not quite sure how much force I'll be able to actually put into it. And number three is the question that we addressed a little bit about how would the people in front be able to handle all that pushing. And I think the answer is part, it's more bracing and forward momentum, but it's not like an all-out scrum like rugby, right? The other thing to keep in mind is that if I lean forward, that takes some of the weight off this sh uh, shield arm. That by leaning in, that person's leaning out, it kind of makes a teepee. And um, in a couple of tests I've done, I'm able to hold this shield for a lot longer than I would otherwise. So it may be that the pushing is in part a, um, an attempt to keep everyone braced, keep them from getting knocked over, but also uh, partly an attempt to, to keep some of that weight um, off that, that shield arm. Because if battles lasted for any length of time, you're going to want to do something with that shield other than just carry it. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Uh, the other thing that we should keep in mind is that the people in front, by transferring the pressure from the chest plate, and you can actually lean the chest plate into the shoulder here, um, is that that pressure is actually not on the person inside at all. It just goes chest plate to shield, chest plate to shield, and that actually sort of turns the people inside into kind of like a Flintstone mobile, right? Where they just sort of kick their feet forward in this giant um, chain of bronze and wood will actually carry all that force. So that would work out okay. 